Thank you, Leah. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. And I'm so excited that we will be able to spend the next couple of hours together and to be able to introduce you to the perinatal mental health um, world. And I would like to talk a little bit about me. I just, I was telling uh, Leah that I just retired from child trauma research program at UCSF uh, in June. And now I am working independently from UCSF doing a lot of trainings in terms of implementing uh, perinatal mental health in primary care. And I am very excited about that. And also this morning, um, one of the things that I guess we will be able to do is for you guys to, this is only like introduction to perinatal mental health and for you to get a little bit familiar with early clinical interventions as a preventive measure for pregnant women and their infants, okay? You are going to have, or probably you have my PowerPoint already available. And um, for me, what is very, very important is to have the opportunity, although this is a, a big group, to have the opportunity to be more interactive and more present, okay? The PowerPoint, you, you will have it and you will be able to go through that. But I think that what is going to be very important is for us to think a little bit about the content of the material that I am going to present and to explore and talk a little bit about uh, what are some of your thoughts or ideas about the, the, the specifically about the clinical vignette that we are going to use, okay? I, I am not <coughs> planning to go through the whole uh, through the whole um, uh, PowerPoint because you have it with you. And as I was telling you, I really want us to be able to have more an interactive uh, um, connection with each other. I know that <coughs> what I am going to ask you for some of you are going is going to be a little bit difficult, but I really, really encourage you that if we can if we can see each other because uh, it's very difficult for me to be able to see how you guys are taking in the material that I am providing to you because if I only see the black screen is very difficult and um, this has to do a lot with the type of work that I am doing okay and that I have been doing for many years this is a relational based model. So the most important thing is the relationship that we are going to establish with the pregnant women, uh, women with the babies who are not yet born and with the whole family system. And then also uh, another thing that is important is how we can collaborate with the medical staff in order to advocate for our clients when they are pregnant on they, or they have their, their children, um, you know, very, very early. Uh, and, um, and it's important for us to be able to advocate for them. And remember the baby, even if the baby is not born, the baby is embedded in a, in a family system and embedded also in a social context. So we are going to provide interventions, not only to the mother and to the baby, but to all the people who are around the baby. <laughs> right now, I am going to share my... Um, my screen. And now we are going to, um, to start. So this is the agenda for today. At the beginning, we are going to do a little bit of introductions that I was uh, sharing with you how I have been working at San Francisco General Hospital. I have been doing infant parent psychotherapy 
and perinatal child parent psychotherapy, and also providing perinatal mental health services in different units, like the neonatal intensive care unit at San Francisco General, the labor, <coughs> sorry, labor and delivery, and also the postpartum unit. And many years ago, I developed a, a model to be able to implement um, how we can in, uh, implement uh, early childhood um, psychotherapy and consultation in primary care, specifically in the units of the Children's Health Center, as well as in the Women's Health Center. Okay, and I want to invite you to please let me know if you have thoughts or questions. So right now, what we are going to be um, doing, I just want to ask a question. Do we know if in this group, uh, the majority of the, uh, um, the participants are doing uh, mental health? You are mental health clinicians. Do we have a, um, uh, medical um, attendees, like nurses or pediatricians, or we don't have any of, uh, of them. Okay. So <clears throat> let's start with, um, with this, you know, because this piece is very important when we are talking about perinatal mental health. And I think that I always like to start with a quote by Winnicott, Donald Winnicott, who was a pediatrician and a psychoanalyst. And he used to say that the story of a human being does not start at five years or two or at six months, but starts at birth and even before birth, if you like. And one of the things that we are going to be uh, noticing is that when we are working with pregnant women, we even do a little bit of assessment about how the mother started to think about getting pregnant when even when she was very young in her life as a child or the stories that she was hearing um, by her uh, mother, grandmother, or some other fam uh, relatives. <clears throat> I would like to share with you the different parts of intervention in pregnancy and the postnatal period. Okay, what we do is that we are going to try to get the pregnant women as early as possible, you know, because uh, you will see the type of interventions that we do in the in the first trimester, in the second trimester, and in the on the third trimester. We are also going to accompany them during labor and delivery. And then we are going to be with them after they deliver their babies. Hopefully the baby uh, that she that the mother delivered is a healthy baby and the, ba and the baby did not have to go to the NICU, to the neonatal intensive care unit. But in case that the baby has to go to the NICU, we can provide perinatal mental health services in the NICU to the mom or, or the primary caregiver and the baby. And also we are going to be with them and providing a lot of therapeutic support during the postpartum period. Okay, why do we want to start very early with this type of interventions during the perinatal period? And let me tell you, the perinatal period, the definition is everything that happens around the birth of the baby, okay? And with this particular mother uh, mod model, what is important is that these interventions can start very early in pregnancy, but they can continue until the, uh, uh, af until the baby has been born. And sometimes we work with them until the baby is a year old, depending on the situation. Then um, why <clears throat> do we do this? is because in this way, we are going to promote <coughs> maternal and infant health and well-being. And the maternal and child health outcomes can be improved in a significant way, okay? Another thing is that we are going to enhance the maternal reflective functioning of the mother. 
what does that mean? That means that we are going to support the mom to be able to understand what is the internal experience that her baby is having in a given uh, at a given moment. Uh, it doesn't matter if the baby is has not still been born, but it's important for us to help the mother to think about how in the different stages of pregnancy, the experience that the baby is having, okay? And the other thing that is very important with this model is that in a way we are going to promote secure attachment. And the reason is because we are going to start, you know, we are going to start early in the process of, uh, of the pregnancy. And so we are going to work with the mom or the uh, other significant uh, partner in, in the work that they can start bonding with the ba their baby even before the baby is born. And in this way, if they can do that bonding uh, during the prenatal period, then the secure attachment, attachment can be promoted, okay? <clears throat> now, one of the things that is very important is that with perinatal mental health, it's a great opportunity to integrate reproductive social justice in mental health services, to address psychological challenges and social disparities, <coughs> and to integrate a cultural attuned family-oriented services that can prepare and prevent the intergenerational transmission of trauma. They, uh, something that I always say is that there are going to be some um, uh, situations in the families in which there is going to be, a, a, some of the relationships are going to be uh, fractured, but that is okay because we have the possibility to repair all those relationships. And the, the perinatal period is a great opportunity for these parents to be able to learn how to repair those uh, fractured uh, relationships. And, um, and as I was mentioning to you, uh, when we are working with this particular um, developmental stage of the mom during the perinatal period, you know, we can collaborate uh, and we can integrate mental health you know, uh, mental health services in primary care. And we can help the mom to have the opportunity to experience that is not that I come to the hospital to get my prenatal care. And then another day I go to see Gloria to get my uh, perinatal uh, uh, child's um, parent psychotherapy. But I, we try to integrate all of them, okay? Um, something that I have been able to develop a little bit is that the, uh, uh, there is going to be a shift in the paradigm from reproductive health to reproductive justice. And that piece is very, very important. And we are going to be working at the level of the individual, in this particular case, at the level of the pregnant woman, the healthcare provider, help the healthcare provider to be able to understand <coughs> what is the internal experience of the mom when the mom is saying that she doesn't trust the medical staff, okay? And in this way, we will be able to, do, to have a huge impact in a positive way at the level of the, uh, the, the health uh, system of care. Um, why is important to start, <coughs> sorry, to start very early? Because in a way, you know, we are going to make the commitment to support these marginalized women and their young children, specifically uh, moms and families that belong to a minority group. And we are going to be addressing reproductive justice, not 
what we have been doing or the hospitals have been doing in the last couple of years, that they do not talk about a rep rep reproductive justice or health until the mom has been uh, has been delivered the baby. We start with these conversations very early in our relationship with the pregnant women. And we are going to focus on the importance of the relationship between the provider, the provider and the patient or the provider and our client and working and collaborating with medical providers to identify and to address reproductive oppression. Um, why this piece is important? Sometimes with the medical, uh, in the medical environment, the doctors, the nurses, the midwives are in the front trying to support all these patients and they don't have the not the time or the possibility to slow down their process and to start thinking a little bit or increase her capacity to be able to reflect on the experience of these moms and these very young children. Okay, um, the idea is that if we continue doing this, we are going to be able to see the, that we are having an impact in the larger systems with the idea that re the, the, of reducing reproductive oppression and creating a community system functioning from a, pre a, a premise of reproductive justice. That women, they need to have access to healthcare, to, cho to have some type of choices in labor and delivery, and some type of choices about what is what they want to do after the baby is born. If they want to continue having more children, or if they want to get more information about what type of birth control they would like to, to have. But all of this happens during the course of the perinatal period, not after the baby is born. Because after the baby is born, the mother is completely uh, overwhelmed with, um, with what is happening to her body because of the changes of hormones and, to have, and also the psychological uh, changes that she's going through during the perinatal period, okay? I would like to spend a little bit of time talking about some of the, uh, of the definitions. What is reproductive justice? And according to this uh, definition, it, it is the complete physical, mental, spiritual, political, and economic well-being of women and girls based on the full achievement and reproduction of women's human rights. This is very important for us to really understand because sometimes what I, uh, what I, I have been witnessing is that the mother just delivered the baby and immediately some of the nurses come into the room and they are asking her uh, what type of um, uh, birth control they would like to have. And the mother, <coughs> psychological uh, from a psychological perspective, they don't want to talk about that. So that's why it's important that in collaboration with the medical staff, we start having these uh, conversations very early, okay? And what is reproductive oppression? Is the result of the intersections of multiple oppressions based on age, class, religion, and sexual orientation. So what are the goals that we can establish when we start thinking about working with the different uh, developmental stages of the pregnancy and the postnatal period, you know, is that we can support reflective practice capacities, not only for the, uh, the mental health providers, but also the medical providers. What are, uh, if we can identify tools that effecti effectively, they are going to address issues of race, class, and culture. 
and to address structural racism throughout the healthcare system and the use of self in patient provider relationships. And this is this last thing is very important for us. How we as mental health providers are going, we are going to use our sense of self in developing and sustaining the working alliances that we have with our <coughs> with our with our uh, clients. Okay. And let's think a little bit about it. The, what, is, what are the core principles of reproductive justice? One of them is the right that, that human being, a human being has not to have a child, or the right that this human being uh, can have a child if that is what that is what they want and wishes the right to parent children, and look at this because this is very important, in a safe and a, in a healthy environment. In addition, reproductive justice demands sexual autonomy and gender freedom for every human being. And if we look at this, a lot of times, for example, at San Francisco General, the type of population with whom I was working, uh, you know, they did not have access to what they wanted or they wish. And it's important, very important for us to ask the question, you know, one of the first questions when we are working with a pregnant woman is tell me a little bit, how was for you when they told you that you were pregnant? I want to know if, she, this was something that she planned, that she wished, or this was like a surprise. And she believes that now she is with this pregnancy, but the mom is not connecting with the baby because she has a lot of ambivalence to towards the baby. That's why these issues are very, very important. And then um, um, here, <coughs> let, let's, um, Let's pause a little bit here because I would like, before we go to this, I would like to take the time with you guys to talk a little bit how it has been for you to hear the material that I have been presenting so far. What are your thoughts or your, um, your uh, emotions when you have been uh, listening to me or your concerns. Do you have some ideas, some concerns, some thoughts about this? I think that it's going to be very important for all of us to be uh, more active during the presentation uh, because in that way we will be able to learn from each other rather than me presenting all the all the material. So I would like to know so far how it has been for you listening to these particular uh, definitions. Is this something that you think about? Yes, Amanda? Yeah, I was gonna say, I really like the, the shift that you're going from reproductive health to reproductive justice to someone who had what I would consider two traumatic births in the past five years and with one being last year um, and had postpartum, um, you know, uh, mental health. I think it's really important just to know that there is this shift and how much that this shift can make a difference for not just the client, which is the mom, but also that parent-child relationship exactly. as well as the family because it impacts the mom, the child, and the extended family, everyone who's involved. Um, so I really would, I'm curious to see how that shift is gonna unfold and how we can continue to support that shift because it really does make a difference, those questions and those the language that is used. Yeah, you are right, Amanda. That's why it's so important to introduce this language when we are working with pregnant women, you know, because this is a, the port of entry of our interventions can have a wonderful impact, not only 
on the mother, but in terms of the relationship between the mother and the baby or the father and the baby, and also what type of relationship and experience this dyad or this triad, these parents with their newborn, what type of experience they are having when they go to see the pediatrician, for example. Um, let's, um, for example, we really help the, the parents to be able to go to the pediatrician uh, appointments with a list of questions or a list of concerns that they have, okay? And sometimes we need to advocate for them. Do uh, you... I, oh, I was just going to mention Devra put in the chat um, that she's not free to speak freely in a shared space, but she appreciates that this redefines the term early intervention. Uh -huh. Yeah. Because if you see, uh, thank you, Leah, that you mentioned that, because <laughs> what we are noticing, if you look at this, is that what a beautiful way to intervene very early in the life of a human being, even before this baby is born. How we can uh, support the parents to welcome this baby, you know, and to feel that we are holding their experience. Um, you will see that uh, in some of the um, um, vignettes that I am going to share with you, some of the moms were not connecting to their babies and they were not really uh, connecting with the, uh, with the clinician because they did not, they do not trust us because of the experience that they have had in the past. So that's why all these things are um, very, very important. Okay, thank you. Um, so let's uh, focus a little bit on, um, uh, on some of the facts that we really need to consider, okay? Black women are three to four times more likely to die from pregnancy related, com related to complications than what happened to white women. And this is not only in terms of uh, African-American black women. This also, we see this in uh, women specifically from Puerto Rico and other parts of Latin America, that they are coming from uh, neighborhoods in which they, they have a lot of needs that basic needs that are not met, okay? Uh, what for me is something that I can, is very difficult to, to even uh, <coughs> understand, is how come all of us who are living in one of the most important wealthy country in the world. And what is amazing is the maternal deaths are increasing in this country. Something that does not happen in other countries that are also wealthy. And the, um, one of the most recent reports have been indicating that 60% of these deaths could have been preventable. And we didn't do that, okay? So if we can prevent the maternal mortality and we are not doing that, that is a form and a symptom of discrimination against women. And it's going to deprive women of their right to live a healthy life on, ba on a basis of equality with men. So do you see how all of this is beginning to, to make sense and why imp how important it is for us um, to to um to start working very early okay this is some is, is statistics that happened in new york city between 2008 and 2012 the severe maternal morbidity increased by more than 28% that's a lot black women were most affected 
with severe maternal morbidity and the rates increase three times more than on, with white women. And <clears throat> as I was telling you, people from, uh, women from Puerto Rico and other Latinas also had, they have had very high rates of uh, severe maternal morbidity. And the rates were highest among those women living in high poverty neighborhoods. So this is something when I am talking with my, the people that I uh, consult or that I supervise, part of the model, model in working with perinatal women is that we provide a, not only non-didactic developmental guidance, but we provide concrete assistance. What does that mean? That if the mother needs, for example, something concrete in her life, we try to connect the mother to different agencies or different uh, programs that will be able to provide her with basic uh, uh, things that she's going to need, okay? In terms of um, two, um, two, two things that are very, very important from a theoretical point of, of view is, a, you know, the goals in the nursery. I think that I hope that all of you have been able to read the ghost in the nursery that was written by Selma Driver and her colleagues, because what is the, the, the ghost? The ghost is going to inv invade not only the, the nursery, but it's going to invade even the body of the mom, okay? So the mother is going to start having some negative perceptions of her pregnancy, and she's going to have to project a negative parental attributions to the unborn baby, and she's going to experience feelings of regret, shame, and guilt. For example, it's very common that when a mother is in the second trimester, when she begins to feel more the movements of the baby and she comes to see us and she has a history of, of um, domestic violence, either when uh, as a child or right now with the father of her children. And uh, she's going to talk about this baby, Gloria is going to be, is already exactly as his father because he is hitting me and kicking me like his father. That is a negative attribution. And we really need to work with this mom about, you know, for her to understand that the baby is not hitting her or kicking her. That the baby is in the second trimester beginning to develop in a very reduced space. And of course, she's going to feel in a very particular way, the movements of the baby. So a lot of what we do is to talk to the baby when the mother is saying that, we can, one of the early interventions could be talking to the baby and saying, oh, your mom is telling me that when you are, uh, when she's about to sleep, you begin to move a lot. And it's because right now you are developing and growing in a very particular way. So I am wondering how it's for you to be inside with so little space. It makes a lot of sense that you move a lot. That is an intervention that I uh, developed for the infant who is not born. And the mom is listening to me and is beginning to have the idea that, um, you know, my baby has his or her own ex internal experience. And that is a very good way <coughs> to help her to bond with the baby, okay? Uh, another thing that we do during the perinatal period is that we address the environmental context of the pregnant women. What are the needs that she has? What is the kind of emotional support that she has or the concrete support that she has? The, does she have family, friends that can support her or she's completely isolated? And then another thing is 
uh, to be able to explore what is the perception perception that the woman has about the, the medical system. That is going to be crucial because we need to uh, help her to trust the medical system and to advocate for her. And also another thing during the perinatal period, you know, during pregnancy is to start talking about reproductive health services. Not to wait until she delivers the baby, but it starts very early, okay? And, and then um, to be able for us as uh, clinicians to identify uh, different forms of systemic racism in where, where our uh, clients are uh, receiving her their prenatal care, or sometimes, uh, you know, the providers have unconscious bias. And the mother is uh, really, um, the mother is um, experiencing that. So that's why it's important to, to be able to do this, okay? Let me... Um, um, One of the things that we know is that um, when we are working um, early in, during the pregnancy, in a way, one of the basic things is that we are going to, uh, to avoid the transmission of trauma, the one generation to another one. I was telling you the case in which the mother says, my baby is exactly like his father, okay? And we know based on the history of the mom, that her father was someone who was very violent toward, uh, toward her mother and toward herself. So that trauma that she experienced, if we don't work through that, she's going to transmit that to this baby and this baby is going to be holding that uh, attribution that the mother is uh, providing to the baby. And we should avoid that, okay? Um, so we know that women with histories of child maltreatment and interpersonal violence are more likely to experience postpartum depression. Women with histories of childhood trauma show an increased comorbidity, comorbidity of postpartum depression and PTSD. And these mothers are more likely to engage in child abuse. So their babies more likely to have a poor perinatal outcome. That's why the early interventions are going to be very, very important, okay? <clears throat> With this type of interventions, in one way or another, we are going to prevent the maternal mortality that we know that it, it is a form of a symptom and discrimination. Um, how her reproductive rights are going, sometimes they are going to be violated. And so how we are going to be able to identify in the system some of the discriminatory stereotypes, practices, and ideologies that are going to perpetuate discrimination against already marginalized groups. So when we are working with pregnant women, we are not only working with the mom and the baby, we are working with the whole system. And to help the, the, the medical system to be able to identify when they are having some issues with discrimination or oppression, okay? Um, and we can help the mom to be able to get a very safe and respect respectful care at birth, that is something very important. That's why we develop a birth plan with the, uh, with the mother. In this way, what we are going to be doing is to help the mother anticipate what is going to happen. So she will be able to, uh, um, to do, you know, to, to be able to do, um, uh, what we really need to uh, to happen, you know? 
what is what she would like to have when she gets to labor and delivery? Who is going to support her? How we can talk to the, to the medical providers and the nurses in the hospital to let them know, for example, that the mother um, will want a, a, a epidural or not an epidural. And we need to, to for the mothers to be able to, uh, um, to, to make a decision very well, um, a very well informed decision is that we really need to let them know if you wait for the epidural for a long period of time, what happens is when sometimes you are almost 10 centimeters delay, dilated, dilated, what is going to happen is that they are not going to put you the epidural because it's too late, okay? And so in this way, when we do the birth plan, we are anticipating a little bit what is going to happen. Now I am going to stop sharing this. <clears throat> and again, I would like us to have a, a, a brief conversation about so far how it has been for you to hear this information. Um, hey, Dr. Castro, I just wanted to bring your attention to some activity in the chat. Um, and uh, they would like to mention that um, the importance of using parent or parents versus mother or mother and father um, so that the language shift is inclusive of, of the LGBTQI families. Yes. Um, and then I, I think that what we can do is later on, we can update the PowerPoint um, language to be more inclusive so that the handout will be like that. Um, but just wanted to give bring attention to that. Yes. Uh, and let me uh, share with you something because that, that is very important. <clears throat> when I am uh, talking about the mother or what I am talking about the father, in reality, what we really need to do is to think about the primary caregiver, okay? And you are going to see the, uh, later on what are the psychological, um, how can I put it? The psychological experience and physical experience that a male or a female they have when the partner is pregnant and they are going to have a, a, a baby. Not only that, I have been able to work with, with parents, specifically uh, fathers, you know, with couples, of fathers that they adopt a child. And a lot of the work that we are uh, we have been doing is what is their experience when they were preparing for the adoption of this particular baby, okay? So every single, when I am working with a family, I really need to understand the, the family constellation with whom I am going to be working. And I should not be assuming that, for example, uh, uh, every single mom who comes to me has a partner, because that is not the case. So we really need to be able to know how to explore this and to be able to hear what the, 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 our clients are telling us and what is the meaning of that. But the psychological, <coughs> the psychological experiences that fathers and uh, uh, I am not going to say, to say well I am going to say that fathers, mothers, males and uh, females and all of that they have a psychological experience and we really need to do be able to assess that how is for them to become a father or to become a mother within the family constellation in which this baby is going to come. And I don't know if, um, if, if this is something that, um, that answer a little bit your concerns about this. Uh, Maria del Rio, I am 
uh, you mentioned here, I have never thought about reproductive justice before, before only reproductive health. That's why I was telling you how there is a shift in the paradigm, paradigm, okay? <laughs> and another thing is that if we do that, we are taking into consideration also and, and rely on the different uh, systems, you know, and to be able to, um, to for, the, for the different uh, subsystems to be accountable. And I, that's why it's very important to talk about these particular uh, issues. Okay. And actually, one of the of what we are going to be doing uh, as I am um, as we are going to be talking a little bit about um, uh, how important it is for us to slow down our process and to think a little bit about this, okay? Okay, I am oh, reading. Um, I just got another message just um, mentioning more about the inclusive language. Um, so, uh, for uh, trans non-binary partners, um, using they, them might be helpful in this case. Um, uh, yes, Leah. And mm -hmm. let me uh, tell you something that is very, very important. The language that I am going to use is the language that my clients are going to, are using. If my client are not using the word mother or father, or they are using the word parent or my partner and not my boyfriend or my girlfriend or my... Uh, it's very important for us when we are doing the clinical work, remember to use the language that my client is using. Why do you think that that is important within the context of what we have been discussing so far? Why do you think that is important to use their language? Well, it's sort of like using someone's name. If they tell you they want to be called a certain name and Ex then you keep calling them another name, that, that's pretty disrespectful. Exactly, exactly. So the first thing when I am constructing my uh, working alliance with my clients is to pay attention. The language has a, is a great, uh, is very powerful. And it helps us to organize us internally, language. But I don't want to impose my, my language to my client because probably for this particular client, you know, the language that I am using is not the language with whom they identify. And I am going to give you a, a good example about this. I am going, let's do this little exercise. I am going to share with you that I am, I was born and raised in Mexico City and I came to the United States in 19, 88 with a baby and my five-year-old uh, son. And the reason why I came to the United States is because my husband was going to do his postdoctoral fellowship at UCSF as a biophysics, okay? I am going to ask you this question and please feel free to answer the question. How do you describe me? From a cultural point of view, how do you describe Gloria? Mm 
because there is a lot of terminology to describe someone like me, right? I can be described as a Hispanic, Latina, an immigrant. How would you describe me? Based on the information that I gave you. Rosemary, you included something that it was, it's very important. If we use the language of, of our clients, they are going to feel seen and heard as for who they are. And Rosemary says, Gloria is a wife, a mother, a daughter, a Latina, a bilingual, a bilingual educator. What could happen if I tell you that I see myself as a Mexican woman living in the United States? I learned to become a Latina when I came to this country. But in the past in Mexico, I have never identified myself neither as Hispanic nor as Latina, let alone Latinx. And what is very interesting is that is the other the one who described me who I am? And that's why it's very, very important to have these conversations with our clients. Not to assume because this is a woman who came from, <coughs> from I don't know, from Mexico. Uh, she is, uh, or she is going to, <laughs> She's an immigrant, she's a Mexican woman, she's a Latina, she's a Latinx, you know. But when I am connecting with someone who listens to the way I describe myself and they describe myself based on, based on what I have been sharing with them, that makes me trust that person. But if I am in a group, specifically a couple of, of a couple of months ago, when someone would be talking to me and saying, you are a Latinx, I said, oh my God, I don't see myself as a Latinx. It, it was the other one who was describing who I am. So from a clinical point of view, I really encourage you to as we we were talking before, as uh, to be able to listen carefully what our clients are the way they see themselves and use that language, because that is a way in which their experience is. This particular woman it understands me. She's listening to me. She really gets that. Sometimes, you know, when I am supervising people who are coming from different parts of Latin America or they have been born in this country, and I do a lot of this work in Spanish, um, sometimes I have been hearing comments like, oh my God, Gloria, this is the first, first time that someone is supervising me and I don't need to explain myself because I, I got it, we get it. And this is very, very important for the work that we do, even if you are not working with pregnant women, but with, uh, with families who have young children, it's important to pay attention to this, okay? Let me know, let me ask you, do you have other comments? or questions? Yes, Orlando? Yes, you're doing a great job. If you can, get you some water or a little tea, you'll be okay. But uh, to your question, I think what's really important is really 
besides describing their who that individual, but to make sure that their paperwork get done. Make sure whatever systematic that you're giving those resources, you have that personal connection. If it's a, a cell phone number or it's an email, because a person can give you all the deliverables, but when you send them to the agencies, it's not funded, they on the waiting list. So I think that give them non-discouragement, just meet them where they at and see how far you can take it. But I don't think describing to me is judge, judgmental. I think that if we just treat each individuals as human beings, uh, they need the care. I don't care what country you come from, you don't need a hand out, you just need a hand up. You know, someone that can stop and listen to you and so forth. But so far, I like the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Orlando. Thank you very much. Okay. So now, one of the things that I would like to do is that I am going to introduce you to um, this particular um, family, you know, and that uh, let's call them Imani and Kevin, okay? And um, I am going to talk a, a, a little bit about this family. And then we are going to be in different uh, small groups and you will be able to talk about some of the questions that I am going to share with you, okay? So let's start with Imani and, um, and, um, and Kevin. Imani is a, a, a 25, um, year old African-American woman who was referred to me at 20 weeks gestational age by her, by her midwife at San Francisco General due to some concerns about that this mom was not bonding with her baby. She was diagnosed with gestational diabetes and hypertension and she was unable to uh, manage uh, both of them. And there were some concerns about that the mother, specifically with the hypertension, she could develop um, uh, what it's called um, pre preeclampsia. Okay, and that is something that we really need to avoid. Another thing that it was very important is that uh, she did not trust the medical staff. She was telling me that. <coughs> Her mother died in a hospital and she was completely convinced that the mother died because the doctors and the nurses were not paying attention to how the mother was deteriorating, okay? On top of that, she has a history of sexual abuse. Let's talk about a little bit the psychosocial factors. When I met this woman, what happened is that um, that she told me that she just she was about to lose her job, and <clears throat> and because she was going to lose her job, um, um, she will be able to continue working with all of us in via medical at San Francisco General. Okay, she was abandoned by her partner when he found out that she was raped and that she was pregnant. And she didn't know if she, if this particular baby was, the, if the father was her, uh. <laughs> her partner or, or the person who uh, raped her. And so she spent the whole, the whole pregnancy, you know, uh, with this uncertainty about who was the father of this baby. And she, was she has a lot of difficulties uh, making the transition from San Francisco General Hospital to Kaiser. And let me explain a little bit about this. At some point when she was already uh, connected with me to work with me um, in terms of perinatal child parent psychotherapy, um, Suddenly, she received a call saying that her job was going to be, that she was going to get back her job. And because she was going to get back her job, 
then her prenatal care was not going to be, uh, she was not going to receive the prenatal care in San Francisco General, but in Kaiser, okay? And she did not have a good and a strong social support network. So these are some of the things that, uh, that I learned from this woman, okay? So let's think about when you are in the, in the uh, small groups, I would like us to think about how was for you to hear about the history of this particular mother. The other thing is what are your, consent, your concerns? And how are you planning to address your cons those concerns? And talk a little bit, think a little bit about how you can support Imani to make the transition from San Francisco General Hospital to Kaiser. So Leah, I don't know if we can, um, if we can organize the group. Yep, breakout groups are ready. Um, okay. And I can open them as soon as she say. Oh, okay. And you put the, the questions here in the chat. That's wonderful, Leah. And so let's see if we can have like 15 minutes to talk about that. 10, 15 minutes, and then you can come back to the big group. And I want you to pick up one of your of the members of your crew to uh, report to the whole group. Okay, let's do that. We are almost back. I don't know who would like to start um, sharing what you discuss in your group. Uh, I can start. We were group seven, but um, okay. Just some of the stuff we kind of talked about was um, just maybe focusing on the mother's mental health because obviously she went through a traumatic experience of being raped, and obviously there's lots of intersectionalities with the with her baby being born as a product or like that uncertainty of who the father is, um, her current partner leaving her. So I think one of the things we wanted to do was identify social supports because it kind of sounds like she could really, she could really use it. Um, just like what you were talking about at the beginning, like we're looking at it from a systems perspective rather than just the, the, the mother and child. Um, and we'd also want to, just get more information about prenatal care. Like, did she, you know, did she, was she, did she receive any prenatal care? She was, um, uh, actually, she was receiving the prenatal care mm, at San Francisco okay. General and the midwife referred her to me because the mother was not bonding with the baby. And she was saying that she doesn't trust the medical providers. And now, the, the challenge is that she was going to uh, to finish her prenatal care in San Francisco General, and she needed to go to Kaiser because of her medical insurance. So what are some of the concerns that you have about that change? What you said, Arthur, is very important. That was right. great. So, so one, one thing that we kind of glanced over was talking about maybe maybe similar to your um, similar to one of your stories is having somebody who's maybe culturally knowledgeable or culturally competent with um, with her sort of her her cultures because that might make it a lot easier in transitioning into into a new into a new hospital that's, you know, mm -hmm. maybe, maybe she doesn't have that trust, but maybe having somebody who understands where she comes from or maybe who has worked with um, survivors or people who've been sexually assaulted, that, that might ease the process of going into Kaiser, I would assume. Very good. And how was for you guys, Arthur, to hear the, this, a mother's history. It was it 
it's it's pretty it was it was tough to hear mm -hmm. and I feel like there's just a lot of things that we could discuss just because it's so complex on the different levels of maybe trauma and different levels of like psychosocial factors that are in play um but this I, i'd imagine just this is just a vignette but if we were in person seeing this I, i'd imagine it to be very heavy mm -hmm. yeah but you address well let's hear other people and then i will go back uh, to what you said because you said several things that were very important thank you arthur who would like to go next we can go next um group okay, number yeah. five um so we have had concerns but <laughs> we wanted to start off with um she doesn't start she doesn't trust medical staff mm -hmm. so when they're saying that they're not that she's not bonding with the baby we want to know more about that and we want to be curious as to who is the person saying this? Is it, are they seeing it from a cultural lens? Is this something that she said? So we want to know more about the narrator of this statement. Mm -hmm. um, we want to be curious about that and not go into thinking that she's not bonding with her baby. Maybe she's bonding with her baby a different way that we don't know. Um, we also were thinking about Dr. Kessler, what you were saying about reproductive health versus reproductive justice. And so we would really ask her where she would like to start. What is concerning her? What is, um, knowing that there is a lot that is concerning her health, her physical health, her emotional health. Um, does she have any friends? We don't know if she has any friends. So there's a lot that we don't know and we don't know know about her lucha, um, su historia, like her history, her struggles, her resiliency. We would be curious about that and wanting to bring that into the treatment. We have a lot of concerns, but we don't have the whole picture of who this client is. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we would also organize resources for her and connecting her maybe to a pre to three nurse um, or connecting her to a community based uh, case manager or a resource specialist so that it's outside of the medical staff. Um, since she doesn't trust medical staff, we want to honor we want to honor that and we would connect her with like someone in the community that can support her in making that uh, transfer to Kaiser um, and then also increasing her social support if it's something that she would like um so having having a friend or having another mother um like a mentor or a peer mm -hmm. support um that is of similar ethnicity that is of similar um uh background so that there are nuances in the culture that you just get um and that um that can help you um with overcoming these challenges so that's kind of what we spoke about. Mm -hmm. uh, let me uh, clarify something, uh, because this is a mom who, when she started, she was beginning to work with me. That's when she got her Kaiser back. So mm -hmm. she was not going to be working with me. So it was going to be very important not to open up something that mm -hmm. we will not be able to, uh, to close, mm -hmm. uh, you know? So the, the most important thing is <clears throat> how we can support her to make the transition from San Francisco General to Kaiser in an easy way. How we can advocate for her in, within the Kaiser system, okay? Right. Okay. The other thing that you said, Maria, that it was excellent also was that you, uh, you, you were wondering about, you know, how come the midwife was saying that the mother was no, was not uh, bonding with the baby. 
So this is a good example about how I, as the perinatal mental health clinician, can contact the referral source that is the midwife and explore with her. Tell me, <clears throat> sorry, tell me a little bit about what made you think that this mom was yeah. not, or this woman was not bonding with her baby, because mm -hmm. she probably is a stereotype that the midwife has. And I need to be clear about that. What does she mean by that? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that that was a, in, in very important. Who else could like to go next? Add um, just one thing that we talked about. I feel like everyone who shared so far has been um, so thorough. Um, the piece that my group talked about a little bit was about specifically related to transitioning from SF General to Kaiser. Mm -hmm. How I've personally had experience where some of my clients who were previously on Medi-Cal um, were being seen by Alameda Alliance, for example, then transitioned to Kaiser. And there were large gaps in the kind of care that could be provided. Like at um, Highland, my kid was able to receive ABA therapy five days a week in person and Kaiser only offers it twice a week um, on Zoom. So mm -hmm. something that we think would be really helpful for this specific case would be working as closely as we can with Kaiser to find out what exactly is going to be offered to mom. Mm -hmm. Our is the care going to be in group settings? Because Kaiser right. offers a lot of group care. Is she going to get that one-on-one -on -one care? Um, because we don't, the last thing we want is for this parent who's dealing with so much as it is to then enter a new healthcare environment where all of these traumas are going to be resurfaced. Oh, look, SF General, they just said X, Y, and Z, and it's not actually happening. Here's another reason to mistrust medical providers. So um, trying to be as thorough as possible in what exactly will mom be getting at Kaiser. Exactly, Amber, you are making a very good point. So one of the things that I am hearing is how important it's going to be for me as a clinician to contact uh, the OB or the midwife who is going to provide the prenatal care of this woman at Kaiser and explain to her with the permission of the mom and explain to this uh, woman uh, why the woman is making that transition to Kaiser and to understand a little bit better what type of prenatal care my client is going to receive over there, okay? One of the things that I was told uh, was that, oh no, we don't have here in Kaiser, uh, Gloria, we do not have a mental health providers that will be able to work with this mom. So one of the things that I said was, do you think that you could feel comfortable if I continue providing mental health services to the mom and later on to the baby, although they are going to receive the, the care, the medical care over there? And she said, that would be great if you can do that. So together, the midwife in Kaiser and I, we develop a plan to make sure that my client was going to get what she really needed, okay? And by doing this, the mother was with me in the office listening to the conversation with the midwife at Kaiser. So in a way, the mother was able to see how I was advocating for her and for the baby. And the clinical intervention of doing that is because what I want to, what I am expecting is the mom is here looking at me on the phone with the people at Kaiser, and I want the mother to be able in the future to advocate for her baby in that medical setting. So do you see how important it is to work with the different levels of the system? Yes, absolutely, that's great. Okay, thank you. Before we go to a break, I would like to ask if there is someone else who would like to offer 
your um a, a little bit of your experience listening to this story and what was what you discussed in your group do you think that there is someone else who could like to talk a little bit more or you are beginning to get tired if that is the case, it's okay. We can break, we can take a break and we can come back. Uh, Leah, at what time can we come back? Oh, whatever you feel comfortable with. Uh, let's come back like quarter to 11. Um, so let's start a little bit uh, talking about um, why um when the father is involved in the birth of the of, of the baby how important it is to welcome the father or uh if there is another um parent who is not the father it's also important to be able to welcome that other uh, um, you know um, member of the of the family system because everybody who is around the, the the pregnant woman is going to have a particular experience of what they are going through okay the only thing that i would like to mention is that it is very well documented for example what happened to the to the fathers of these babies oh. <laughs> you know that there, uh, there is going to be, their bodies are going to go through uh, significant changes at the level of biological changes uh, during pregnancy. And there are going, there is going to be an increase in prolactin levels, testosterone le and the testosterone levels are going to decrease. Another thing that we uh, know nowadays is that the body mass index is increased during pregnancy. And uh, sometimes uh, fathers, when they are involved, they are uh, presenting some somatic symptoms called, like morning sickness, nausea, insomnia, food cravings, and things like that, okay? And um, I think that one of, uh, of the things that I have learned throughout the years in which I was doing this work at UCSF is that we need to be very careful, you know, not to put, a, not to avoid making connections when there is a father to make connection with the father of the baby. Because what happened is that um, a couple of years ago at different hospitals, there was a, a big effort to screen for interpersonal violence. So even if the fathers, would come or another significant person in the life of this baby was coming to the to the hospital, they were not invited to join the meeting with us. And I think that uh, these other significant others mentioned to me how they were feeling that they were put aside and nobody was talking about what they needed and what they really wanted. So, that's why it's important for us to think about that. Now, there is going to be something that I really want to highlight. Some factors like maternal or paternal mental health, like for example, uh, disorders in anxiety, depression, PTSD, those are going to have a huge impact on the baby, okay? On the development of the baby. Uh, for example, we know that prenatal maternal stress is linked to alterations in the in the fetal development. Okay, there is going to be a lot of stress at the level of the placenta, and also a lot of changes in the newborn brain structure. So, for example, we know that the respiratory sinus arrhythmia is a marker of self regulation. During the postnatal period, a lot of the interventions that we are going to be uh, <coughs> providing to the to the family is how the family can co-physiologically regulate with this baby 
And it's important to do that because the co-physiological regulation is the basis for emotional and behavioral regulation. Okay, that's why it's so important to do that. When I am talking about co-physiological regulation, I am talking about how, uh, how the sleep patterns are going on with the newborn, the, the feeding episodes, how they are going, how if the baby's crying, how the, the parents are uh, helping the kid to be self-regulated or at the beginning co-regulated. So that physiological co-regulation that happens just as soon as the baby is born is going to be very, very important. Another uh, uh, psychosocial stressor is when the mother did not or, or the partner did not plan this pregnancy and it was more like a surprise, but they wanted to continue with the pregnancy, that is going to have a huge in, in, in impact on the way the parents are going to relate with, the, with this particular baby. And also if, if the parents are under a lot of stress, the possibility for interpersonal violence is going to increase. And that, of course, is going to have a huge impact on the development of the baby, okay? Here, um, I put this particular definition of what is perinatal uh, mental health. I really encourage you to read about, uh, about it because I think that is very, very important to be clear what is what we know as me perinatal mental health, okay? And that is going to cover the prenatal period and the postpartum period until the baby is more or less a year old, okay? Uh, <laughs> so there are some factors like the socioeconomic status of the family, race, ethnicity, the lack of social support as we have been talking about is going to make a huge influence uh, in terms of the woman's uh, risk of experiencing perinatal mental health issues and the likelihood that she will seek and receive adequate treatment is going to depend on how we are going to support this particular mom, okay? Uh, and sometimes there is a fear of a stigma can also prevent women from seeking care, the care that they need. However, even if a woman seeks care, she may not have access to the services that she really wants and that she really needs. So we, the perinatal child parent uh, clinician, uh, we can um, advocate for all of this, okay? And then um, another uh, issue that is very important in our work is the meaning of infant mental health. What is infant mental health? And in reality, it's the capacity that the infant and the young child uh, is going to have to experience, to express, and to regulate emotions. Uh, another thing that is very important in the infant mental health is the possibility for the child to be able to develop a secure relationship with the, uh, 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 with the parents or another significant other and to explore the environment and to learn from the environment. Uh, and of course, all of this within the setting of the cultural environment, okay? Um, and babies' emotional, social, and cognitive development and, and competencies unfold in the con context of relationships. So this is a very important thing for us to always keep in our mind. The development of the child and the growth of the child is happening not in a vacuum, but within relationships, okay? And something that we have learned in the last couple of years is that if we support the primary caregiver as well as the infant, this is going to optimize the young child's functioning. So that's why these early interventions are very important. And now, um, what are the primary tenets of infant mental health? I am going to uh, describe here <coughs> something that is very important. Then the first one is a strength-based 
approaching assessment and intervention with a relational framework and viewing development within the cultural context. But always that is done with, uh, with this a particular vision of a strength base. Then uh, also another tenet is the special attention that we put to relationships at different levels. And although they are independent, they are going to influ influence each other. That's why the systemic perspective is very important and the relationships that we are going to form are, are crucial. For example, with the vignette that I mentioned to you, one of the things is that you heard me saying that one of uh, one thing that I did was to connect the mom with the uh, um, with the people at Kaiser, but in order to do that, I had to establish a relationship with a midwife in in Kaiser, <coughs> and to think together how we were going to support this mom. Um, Another piece that is important always to remember is that the human development, <coughs> I'm sorry. is going to occur within, within cultural and environmental context, okay? Uh, and this piece is very important for the work that we do. So here, I don't know if you have had the opportunity to read two articles that I think that they are crucial in this work or in the work that we do with very young children. And these are the seminal articles in infant mental health. Number one is the one that was published by, by Selma Freiber, who was the woman who coined the infant mental health term. And also she was the one who wrote about ghosts in the nurseries, how the past of the mom is going to come up during the perinatal period and is going to have a huge impact on the way the mother is going to perceive her pregnancy, her baby and the world that is around her. And there is another, <clears throat> another article that, we, that was, uh, written by Alicia Lieberman and Patricia Van Horn and Chandra Ippen, that is uh, Angels in the, in the Nursery. And what Alicia Lieberman has been saying is that, um, the, you know, the child parent psychotherapy has a psychoanalytic approach, okay? To treating the uh, infant parent diets within the context of the primary attachment relationship. And she talks about angels in the in the nursery, and this is a this uh, and we explore what are the angels that these moms have, what are the benevolent memories that they can share with us about uh, themselves when they were very young. Okay, there are some mothers that are going to say that they don't have any beautiful memories, but that doesn't mean that they cannot start building these memories in the relationships that they are establishing with us, okay? So I want to uh, talk a little bit about how the model has been evolving. And at the beginning, you know, we have here the infant parent psychotherapy that led to the child parent psychotherapy that was developed by Alicia Lieberman. And then based on all on these two, we develop the perinatal child parent psychotherapy, but always thinking that perinatal CPP has two branches that are very important, reproductive health and infant mental health. <clears throat> okay, now um, I would like to talk a little bit about Selma Freiberg, uh, as I was telling, as I was telling you before. Selma Freiberg was a, a social worker who was working at the University of Michigan and at some, in a program that she established with babies and their parents. And what happened is that UCSF invited her to come to San Francisco to open the infant parent program. And that's what she came 
that's what she did. She came to the Bay Area and she opened the infant parent program. Unfortunately, uh, she got brain cancer and she died like almost a, a, in a couple of months after being here in the Bay Area. And then the one who was the director of the infant parent program was um, uh, Jerry Paul, we have here Jerry Paul, who was the director of the infant parent program for many years. And uh, Alicia Lieberman came to the infant parent program uh, to work with, um, with Jerry Paul. And then later on, what Alicia did was that she opened the child parents, uh, the, the child trauma research program and she developed what we know now as child parent psychotherapy. And um, the focus of that modality of treatment was that Alicia was one of the pioneers about exploring the history of trauma that our clients have in a very particular way, okay? And I would like to, uh, <clears throat> to mention that infant parent psychotherapy, you know, the focus of the interventions are going to be in terms of the relationship between the parent and the baby. We are going to be able to identify how the goals of the, uh, that the mother is bringing into that relationship is going to be played out. And part of what we do in infant parent psychotherapy is help the mother not to make those attributions that are completely um, uh, you know, they are not based on reality and we need to work with her around that so she can have a healthy relationship with her baby, okay? But uh, the centrality of the focus in infant parent psychotherapy is the diet. In perinatal child parent psychotherapy, again, the focus of our interventions is the diet or the triad if there is another partner involved, okay? We, uh, people, sometimes they think that what we do when we are working with a pregnant mom is that we do individual uh, treatment and that is not the, the case. We are thinking all the time about the baby, even if the baby is not in the room. We are going to give voice to the baby so the mother begins to be able to keep in her mind the, this particular baby, okay? Here is a little bit, a, a summary of how the history of trauma that the mother has is going to build up uh, in a way that she's going to, uh, that history of trauma is going to lead to the ghost, okay? And the ghost is going to prevent the parent to see the baby in his own right. And the clinician is going to address the mother's misperception by providing a non-didactic developmental guidance. In this way, the baby is liberated from the mother's distortion. And here I would like to make a pause because I would like to ask the group who, um, if you can tell me a little bit what is the meaning of non-didactic developmental guidance and why this early intervention is very important during the perinatal period? Who can talk a little bit about this? Have you heard about this concept? No. Is there someone who has been uh, attending a... a a training in, wh in which the, uh, the presenter has been talking about uh, the non-didactic developmental guidance and why that is an early intervention. See then how we call non-didactic, the opposite of psychoeducation. We do not teach the mom uh, or, the, or the parent about development, the, child, the baby's development. We do not teach that. We are going to, to talk about what is the experience that the baby is having right now. <laughs> For example, 
when I am working with a two-year-old and the two-year-old is trying to ride a, a tricycle and the mother says, do not try, do not ride the tricycle because you are going to fall down. And the baby doesn't doesn't listen to, to what the mom is saying. She he tries to uh, ride the, the tricycle and he fails down. Um and the mother looks at the baby and the mother is not going to uh, retreat the baby and to comfort the baby who is crying. And the mom is telling the baby, I told you, I told you, and you didn't listen to me. Now that's why you felt that, okay? When I am saying I am going to develop a non-didactic developmental intervention, what I am going to do is, I am noticing several things. The mother is not um, soothing the baby, is not reassuring the baby that she will be, that the baby will be able to try again with the support of the mom. The mom is not doing that. Okay. So my intervention, instead of being targeting the mom, is going to be targeting the to the toddler. And I am going to say, <coughs> "Oh, little Juanito." Um, you were trying so hard to um, to uh, to ride your tricycle, and then you fell down, and it was something that you were not expecting. And I am wondering that probably we will need to wait a couple of more months in order for you to be able to ride your bicycle without any help any support but right now i am wondering if your mom can help you to ride your bicycle i am teaching the mom that the baby is not that the baby the, the toddler does not want to do that in a correct way is that the baby is not there developmentally and we need to wait and in order for the for the toddler to be there the, the toddler is going to need a lot of support from the mom but I am not teaching the mother that. Why do you think that I do not teach the mother that? Why do you think that I am a, a conscious about not teaching the mother what I just mentioned to you? Give me some ideas, Esther. Hi. Yeah, I think there's a lot of purposes that potentially that serves your um, not imposing one way or your way or like a right way for the parent to respond. You're just offering another way of seeing the situation and understanding what's happening um, for the for the parent, for the child and what's happening between them. Mm -hmm. So you're just opening up space for other possibilities. Um, you're also offering to the child another way of registering what the what the parent is doing and you're also offering the parent another way of understanding what what's going on for the child which again serves um the relationship but i think ultimately it can be um more empowering to the to the parent in this situation um that ultimately they're still deciding uh what 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 they'll do next or what will happen next and also the child is um you know participating in in that you're not prescribing a particular way that this is meant to uh -huh. unfold and you're also leaving room for other ideas so the parent you know might offer you additional kind of feedback or thoughts about what just happened and so there's room for a dialogue and there's room for the parent to you know bring in other considerations or other concerns or other beliefs um, rather than it being so uh, unidirectional and prescriptive. Mm -hmm. Uh, because in a way, Esther, what is happening is that I want to offer the mother with ample opportunities of feeling good about herself as a mother. But if I teach her the nonverbal message is you don't know how to do it. I am the expert and I am going to teach you how to do it. And we don't want that. We want the mother <clears throat> to come up with her own ideas. And the most important thing, this intervention is going to have a huge impact on the toddler because the toddler is going to experience, oh, this lady 
is listening to me and she's getting where I am. And he's helping us. He's, she's helping my mom and me. She, the baby knows what is happening, okay? So this is one of the early interventions that we can, um, that we can use, okay? Uh, <clears throat> another uh, intervention is to provide concrete assistance um, for things that are related to their uh, to the daily life of the of the family. For example, if the mom comes and she says, "Gloria, my baby is about to be born, but uh, I don't have the car seat," and uh, the the midwife told me that if I don't bring the the car seat. After I deliver the baby, they are not going to uh, <laughs> allow me to bring the baby out of the hospital. Okay, so one of the ways in which I provide concrete assistance is to connect the mom with one of the family resource centers in the community that I know that they can offer her the car seat. Why, why I am doing that intervention? Because the same way that I am paying attention to the need of the mom, I want the mom to pay attention eventually to the needs of the baby and to advocate for that. Now, uh, before we go, um, before we go to to the next thing, I would like to ask you. Um, how is that, what are your thoughts about what we just discussed or your questions? Uh. <laughs> or concerns about these type of inter interventions? Okay. So let's go and continue. Um, um, so when we are talking about the ghost, something that is very important is that these ghosts um, are um, in a way um, distortions of the perception that the mother has about the baby. You know, she doesn't see the baby the way the baby is because she's projecting onto the baby a lot of uh, attributions that are not related to the baby, but are related to the trauma history that the mother is bringing into this, uh, into this uh, particular um, uh, relationship, okay? So the, uh, something that is very important about the goals are two things. When we are assessing the history of the parent, uh, the parent is going to start talking a little bit about some of the memories, the childhood memories that the parent has, okay? It's very easy, not very easy, but it's easier for the parent to retrieve a memory, a traumatic memory, rather than retrieve the memory and be able to identify the affect of that memory. It's very difficult for parents to be able, they can say, oh yes, I remember when my, my father used to come home and he would uh, um, hit my mom and then he could hit all of us and then he could leave the home, okay? The mom is able to retrieve that memory, but the way the mom is talking to me about the memory is completely uh, uh, without any affect. And if we do not help the mom to recover the affect of that memory, what is going to happen is that she is going to repeat over and over again that particular uh, trauma. And now with her baby. So that's why it's important, not only to retreat the memory, but to help the mother to, to think a little bit. So you are telling me that when you were three years old, your father was hitting your mom and blah, blah, blah. 
So how was that for you? You were very little and nobody was explaining to you why your father was doing that. How was that for you? So I begin to help the mother to retreat the affect, okay? And then the angels are those benevolent emotional experiences that the people we, we can have with primary love objects. And these memories with these people are going to give us a sense of having, having the experience of being protected, loved, <laughs> uh. <laughs> sorry, and cared by someone. And what is beautiful, the same way that is very sad that we can transmit the trauma to, from one generation to another one, those goals. We can transmit the, go, the angels and that is beautiful. And so in the therapeutic relationship, we can help the mom to construct those angels right now because she would like to be able to transmit that to her, to her baby. Okay, so let me uh, explain to you a little bit about the perinatal and postnatal lenses. If you look at this uh, picture, I put that the approach is relational. This is very important. Within the cultural context, we pay a lot of attention to different systems in which the baby and the mother and the father or the other uh, primary caregivers are embedded. And we pay a lot of attention how all of this is going to have a huge impact on the development of the mother, the father, or the other uh, partner in, in, uh, because of the trauma that they have experienced. And we don't want this trauma to be transmitted now to the baby because then his or her development is going to be derailed. So when we are talking about uh, uh, the different phases of perinatal mental health uh, uh, psychotherapy, we are going to have three phases. The initial phase, that, that's when we are going to gather a lot of information about the history of the mom, the medical history, the psychosocial history, what are the stressors that this mom is going through um, then we are going to be able to develop a treatment plan of care. All of this is in collaboration with the, with the uh, client, okay? Mm -hmm. And then we are going to have the last uh, particular phase mm -hmm. that is termination or the consolidation of the treatment. In the initial phase, what we are going to be gathering, if you look at this, is framing this is number one, framing the dyadic or triadic work. From the very beginning, you were referred to me because there were some concerns from your doctor or your midwife about challenges that you are uh, <coughs> experiencing right now with your diabetes and your uh, hypertension. And you came to the right place because here, we are going to be working you, your baby, your other partner and me together to be able to welcome this baby, okay? We are going in the initial phase, develop and strength the working alliance and we are going to create a safe container for the mom or the father or the partner to be able to explore some of the very difficult issues that they will need to explore. We are going to gather personal information as well as family, uh, as family information. And we are going to share the results of the initial phase with the mom. <clears throat> and I am going to tell you a little bit how we do that. Is that imagine that we have a triangle and we say, you know, because of all the things that you happen as a, as a in the case of the uh, vignette that I share with you, because of the, uh, because of the very difficult experience you had when you were uh, raped, 
it was completely understandable that it was difficult for you to connect with your baby because you did not even know who was the father of this baby. And if you cannot connect with the baby, of course, it's going to be very difficult for you to be able to start looking at this baby and be ready to welcome your baby. But you are coming to the right to the right place for us to work together, okay? Here, um, in terms of developing the treatment plan of care, I put you some of the interventions that we, that we use, okay? <clears throat> that we have been talking a lot about this. Um, something that is very important is that uh, the unborn baby is going to become like the transference object from past experiences. And the parents can have positive or negative maternal or paternal attributions. And during these different stages of the perinatal period, the, the identity development of the parents is going to go through significant <coughs> transformations. Okay. <clears throat> And we talk about all of this. Uh, in terms of termination, we are going to invite the mom, the family, to reflect on the gains that they had be during the treatment, to consolidate those gains, to anticipate what might be happening when they just stop coming to treatment, because they will stop coming to treatment, but the baby <clears throat> or the toddler will be developing, continue developing. And in every stage of his development, there are going to be some challenges. So we need to anticipate that, okay? Another thing is that if the parent has a history of abandonment and neglect, sometimes the termination phase is experienced as an abandonment by the clinician, okay? <clears throat> And we are going to help them to, uh, to start thinking about how in the future there are going to be some uh, conflicts in terms of their relationship, but always that rupture in the relationship can be repaired. And that is going to allow the parent to get, gain a better self-understanding, even if they are not anymore with us. Okay, we talk about <clears throat> about these concepts already, but I included this slide just for you to uh, to keep it in the in the uh, in the um, in the in the PowerPoint. Okay. Um, another thing that is very important is that um, the maternal mental health. That means the depression, anxiety, PTSD is going to affect one woman in every five women, okay? And these are the number one complication of pregnancy and childbirth, the maternal mental health. And suicide combined with a overdose is going to be the number one leading cause of death for women in the first year of postpartum. That's why we continue providing psychotherapy to these moms until the baby is a year old to make sure that the mom is doing well in terms of her mental health. <coughs> and in this way, we are addressing racial inequities uh, that are very important when we see them you know, it's not only that we are going to screen for uh, postpartum depression, okay? But is how what is what we are going to give them when they screen for uh, as um, uh, postpartum depression? So here I put you the perinatal pregnancy and the postnatal period. In terms of mood, we see a lot of depression, bipolar, and psychosis. In terms of anxiety, we see the general anxiety disorder, panic attacks, OCD, and PTSD. And uh, 
in, in reality, we call them disorders because in one way or another, all of this is interfering with the uh, uh, daily functioning of the mom or the parent, okay? What happens if we do not address the, these perinatal mood disorders? There are going to be significant conflicts or relationships problems. They are not going to comply with their medical care. Their all their uh. <laughs> medical condition are going to be exacerbated. They are going to end up with interpersonal violence, separation, or divorce, and the loss of interpersonal and financial resources. Some of them are going to go to disability and employment. They are going to neglect or abuse their children. They are going to have developmental, these babies are going to have developmental delays or behavioral problems. And also they are going to be in a situation in which the mothers or the parents are going to use more tobacco, alcohol, or other type of drugs. And, and we need to take into consideration that sometimes they have this suicidal ideation or they uh, end up, you know, killing their babies. So that's why it's important to take in a serious way all of this, okay? Here, <clears throat> I, I am going to, um, I don't want to go through every single slide, the ones that we have right now, but I want you to know that these mood disorders are going to have a huge impact on the development of the infant, the attachment quality of the infant, the cognitive intellectual functioning, and the neuroendocrine and psychophysiological uh, functioning, okay? And I included here <clears throat> some of the things that we see in terms of the development, okay? And why this is important when we are using the Braselton neonatal assessment scale, because these can be uh, uh, um, used to, in a way, predict the cognitive abilities of the baby, okay? So it's important to address and keep track of the development of the, of the baby. We know that when a mother has not been able to address her mental health issues, we are going to have a, a, some type of insecure attachment and disorganized, disorganized attachment, okay? And when a, a, a child is insecure attached, this can lead children to have negative expectations for other relationships and negative self-perceptions, leaving the child very vulnerable to depression, okay? And also uh, there is going to be a, a decrease in the le left frontal brain activity. And I talk about this already, okay? Why is important the Bailey scales? Because it's giving us an idea of how the cognitive intellectual uh, uh, thing is happening. In the postnatal period, the only thing that I want to say is how important is that the mother with our support will be able to self regulate co-physiological regulate with the baby. So when they come and we see that the mom is breastfeeding the baby, that is a great opportunity to help the mother understand what is the, the experience that her baby is having at this particular time. Uh -huh. Okay, <clears throat> so I think that I am going to stop here. There is a lot of information in these slides that you will be able to continue uh, reading and, uh, and trying to uh, understand. Right now, uh, one of the things that I would like to, uh, to open up this space, you know, we have a couple of more minutes is um is to think a little bit about you know if this information that you got this morning is something that you believe that you will be able to use in your practice and if so in which ways
Yes, uh, Orlando. Yes, I, for me in the field that I do, I just be more informal and I be more connected with real life people that I met on this Zoom that I can now reach and share the connections in the field that really help. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. And uh, um, Esther was talking a little bit about if we can consider uh, more recent traumatic experiences in intimate relationships, for example. Uh, and another thing is if they have had, if the mother has had a traumatic delivery or if they have had a perinatal loss that the baby uh, died, those are issues that we need to explore and address during the pregnancy. Okay, that is very, very important to address because if we do not address previous losses or previous traumatic deliveries that the mother has had in the past, what happened is when she delivers this baby, she, she's going to have a very hard time being able to be focused on the here and now with this baby. You know, the images are coming uh, for her, will be coming for her. Yeah, and my question, I was kind of, and maybe this is like getting overly technical or bogged down by the language, but I was just kind of curious if we would consider those types of experience when we're thinking about ghosts, because I'm thinking, well, um, there's a way in which those early childhood experiences and experiences with primary attachment figures early in life really kind of come to the fore when, when, um, when someone's preparing to have a baby or pregnant um, or during the perinatal period. But also these other experiences come forward too. And um, I guess I was kind of wondering if it <clears throat> makes sense to kind of separate out those early experiences from these more recent experiences that a, that a parent might have, or, or if we kind of, you know, um, if, if it feels appropriate to kind of consolidate or like think about them together when we're thinking about ghosts in particular, because some might be, some of those salient experiences might be from their own experiences being parented, but some of them might be from intimate partner relationships or, you know, like you were saying, um, recent experiences of traumatic birth or um, loss of the child during birth. Um, so I wonder if you could just speak to that piece. Yes, uh, Esther, one of the things when we are working with the impact of trauma on the relationships between parents and, and children, is that we should not be uh, uh, separating these ghosts. And the reason is because the trauma, what the trauma does is when the trauma hits the individual, there is a lot of fragmentation about my sense of self, the way I see myself, and also <clears throat> the whole system is fragmented. So what I want to do is that if the, <laughs> Uh, if the mother is talking to me about how she witnessed a lot of uh, physical abuse when she was a little kid, but right now she is experiencing interpersonal violence, I want to connect the two of them because it makes sense for it makes sense that the mother is right now involved in that type of relationship because what she learned in the past is that the person who was supposed to love me, care for me and protect me was the same person who was hurting me when I was a little kid. So it makes a lot of sense that now with this uh, a partner that she has, she is something that we call in psychology, the internal working models. How we, how we learn in a very particular way, a, 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 the way we relate to significant people in our lives, what are the messages that we got about not only that individual, not only about my father, but a lot about me as an individual, and also about the world in which I am living. So your question is very important. I would not separate them. I could connect them, integrate them. And I could say, it makes a lot of sense. You leave as a little child this, and 
And now this is the pattern of interaction that you have had with, the, with your actual partner. So together we are going to be talking about how we, uh, <clears throat> how you will not transmit that to your kid. Does that make sense, Esther? Yes, thank you. I think that um, in the you know early writings about the ghosts in the first writings, there's more focus on those early experiences and trauma experienced at you know in in early stages of life affect um, like to your point, you know those internal working models and the development of sense of self, all these things in a different way than if if they are experienced as an adult, for example, without previous experiences of a similar nature. So uh, I just appreciate you speaking to yeah, the importance of integrating and bringing those things together because they're not, they're, they're very deeply related. Yeah. Um, and I think sometimes that can be the entry actually into thinking with a caregiver more about early experiences. Sometimes they come to us and the thing that is coming up kind of you know, bubbling up most at the surface is their current intimate partner relationship, for example, in which there might be conflict or violence present. Um, and sometimes it's like through talking about that and exploring the impact of that, that we might learn about other experiences that came before. So I just kind of, yeah, I wanted to highlight, highlight that. Yeah. And that's why it's important to address that what is happening right now and for example, one of the biggest um, issues or themes that we explore with pregnant women is if they have had previous perinatal losses. So we can address those perinatal losses, help them to mourn that loss in order to be able to connect with a new baby. Because if, if they don't go through that mourning process, they will, they will have a very difficult uh, experience connecting with the new baby. So we work with the two things. Thank you. Uh, I would like to ask if there are other people who have comments or questions. I'm so happy, Maria Del Rio, that you made that connect yeah. <laughs> connection about reproductive justice. That is important. And if you can live today with that idea, I think that I will be very happy. How we can use that term in, in the world that we uh, do on daily basis, okay? Yes, you are right, Mina. Um, this is very important, what you just mentioned in terms of the ghost in the nursery. Actually, when I am working with perinatal mental health, even if you are working with a teenager or an adult, it's important to explore how was for this individual to come into this world, in what conditions this individual came to this world. So it's important. Very important when we are working with very young children, but also very important <clears throat> when we are working with, um, how it's called, with adults. Other questions that you have or, or comments or concerns that you would like us. We have a couple of more minutes and I would like to use them for your thoughts. Yeah, Mina, those uh, articles are uh, very important, instrumental in, uh, in, in the work that we do in infant mental health. Very good. And I, the ones who haven't been able to read, um, who have not been able to read these articles, 
I think that I really encourage you to, to, to read the articles because they are very good. And just a side note, they're included in the materials uh, folder. Okay, good. Do you have some uh, questions that you would like to ask me before we finish? What other thoughts do you have? Can I just chime in to um, add something to that piece, Gloria? Yes. Um, just thinking about, you know, as a as a non provider, and you know, when you're with other people important to you in your life, there are yeah, opportunities to do something similar to what you just described, Gloria, like that medical advocacy piece and thinking with friends or family about their experience with medical providers as they're carrying a baby or they're going through a process related mm -hmm. to reproductive health or justice, that these are conversations we can have with our loved ones, um, so that their experience, you know, is, um, and, and their, their own subjective kind of experience of, um, their interactions with their medical providers is held outside, you know, with, with other people who know and mm -hmm. love them and is talked about in a different way that that can be really powerful to, um, yeah. You know, Esther, for example, there is something that you would see very common with these particular uh, moms who just deliver their babies is that um, suppose that the mother had a, a, a loss. The mother came to the hospital and when the mother came to the hospital, she wa the baby was already dead and they have to deliver a dead baby. When the mother goes to see the, 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 the doctor, the OB or the midwife, they are going to tell her, you don't, don't worry, sometimes, depending on the physician, uh, don't worry because you will be able to, uh, to get pregnant again. And uh, so your body is ready. You can get pregnant whenever you want. I have been doing a lot of work with the OB and the midwives around that. Probably from a physical point of view, the body of the mom is ready to get pregnant again. But from a psychological point of view, the mother is not ready to deliver another, to be pregnant again. So we need to work on that with the, the client and with the providers, because then the providers, they, uh. <clears throat> the mother is getting very conflictual messages from all of us. And she is going to get pregnant when she hasn't been able to mourn the loss of this particular baby. That is not okay. And I would like to ask you because uh, in two weeks I am going to do, no, a couple of, in, in two weeks I am uh. <coughs> to do this in Spanish. But then, uh. <clears throat> oh my God, in November, I, I am going to be doing the second part of this presentation in English. And I would like to know if some of you are coming to that presentation because it's going to be like part two. Okay. And I am going to present a case that is a little bit more, um, more, um, more complicated and uh, more sophisticated in terms of how we are going to um, how how we are going to talk about that. Let me tell you, Esther, when the part two is going to be. It's in November. In November second, um, or November second. Gloria? Sí. 
Will it be a repetition of the material just in Spanish? Because you said part two, which to me means no, I'm so additional sorry. material. I made, yeah, I made a mistake, Rosemary. Uh -huh. uh, part two of, of this particular presentation that we had today is going to be on November the 2nd. Okay. Uh, in two weeks, I am going to do the same presentation, but in Spanish. Okay. And okay. the reason why I am going to do it in Spanish is because for people who provide services in in Spanish, it's important once again to be able to think about the language that we use, taking into consideration the cultural aspect. We do not ask, for example, our clients in Spanish, como, eh, como te sientes? ¿Cuáles son tus sentimientos? We don't use that language when we are doing the work in Spanish, okay? We, because they are going to answer, bien. And the conversation is going to end over there. Bien, but gracias. It, bien, gracias. But if we <laughs> ask the mom, <clears throat> tell me a little bit, how was for you? I am going to say it in English and then in Spanish. Uh, tell me a little bit, how was for you since the last time we saw each other? Platíqueme un poco cómo fue para usted. ¿Cómo ha sido para usted desde la última vez que nos vimos? ¿Ves? El lenguaje es diferente. Que si lo traducimos literalmente al inglés. ¿Ok? Por eso lo vamos a hacer en, en español. Pero el del 2 de noviembre es la parte 2 de esta. Gracias. ¿Ok? Y el contenido es diferente. El de la semana, en dos semanas es el mismo. Uh -huh. <coughs> Well, I really appreciate your attention and uh, and I hope that um, that it was helpful. And um, please let me know if you have questions, you can send me an email, okay? You don't have questions right now before we finish? Okay, then I guess what we'll do is we'll thank Dr. Castro so much for your time today and such great presentation. And we'll also thank everyone who joined us today and let you know that you. To, to be on the lookout for the evaluation, which will be coming in your mailbox later today. And um, we'll hope to see you again at a, another training really soon. I hope you all have a great day. Thank you. Have a nice evening. Thank you.